I just feel like there's so many people who've studied herbalism that just give up on that on that heart path because they can't see how to get to that other side of the ravine. Yeah. So I feel like sovereignty herbs and you know with the herbal practice connection and my clinical mentorship like that's the mission. The mission yeah. is like we need more clinical herbalists working one on one with clients hands down let's get you all across the ravine. Yeah. You know, this is this is how I made the leap. This is how I got across the ravine. It may not work for you, but like at least you'll have a blueprint to figure it out for yourself, you know. And so it just it's making that I don't know if I can do this to like oh hell yeah, I can do this. Welcome to the Herbalist Hour. This is where community gather, merging the power of people and the flowers, the sweet and the bitter to the salty, the sour. Oh, mommy, it's time for the Herbalist Hour. Welcome back to the Herbalist Hour. Today I'm really excited to have on my good friend, Erica Gallantin. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Yeah. And we're here at this awesome, amazing event. It's called the Great Lakes Herb Fair. And I'm just curious, you just came from teaching a class, and I'm just kind of curious what you taught, how yeah. it was received, any Cliff's notes you want to give us? Oh, it was super fun. I'm still kind of buzzing, actually. <laughs> um, so the class that I taught this afternoon was uh, Herbal and Aromatic Energetics in the Emotional Realm. Oh. Yeah, so looking at, focusing specifically on how we can use aroma from plants to help navigate all of the things that we go through uh, in our emotional lives, which are very much a part of our physical lives. And there's an interconnectedness there. Um, and so I use some examples um, of aromatics I brought with me. I did use the structure of the four elements to kind of guide us through the class. Uh, it was really super beautiful. It was supposed to be a three hour class, but it ended up being an hour and a half <laughs> class. And I had all of these things I wanted to say and at the end felt really rushed, but that's just the way it goes. So. So yeah. you just talked super fast the whole time and got all three hours in then? It started off really slow. Let me fix that. <laughs> it started off really slow and I'm like, oh, I've got all the time in the world. And all of a sudden I've got 20 minutes. I have two elements to get through. And I'm wow. like, okay, here's yeah. the speed version. I love it. Um, but it was really beautiful. I yeah. just have to ask from a personal selfish standpoint, if you're currently experiencing same, saying a really like difficult time and you're trying to like snap out of it, say, is that a good time to say use aromatherapy like to oh, kind of call back memories? Is that sure. kind of what you're talking about there? Or? Yes, yeah, I think so. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that's really cool about our sense of smell is that it's hardwired into the parts of our brain that are thought to be responsible for memory and emotion. Yeah. Um, and they do not, like our sensation of, of olfaction or our sense of smell doesn't get processed by the logical centers in our brain before it's having an impact on us. Okay. It's actually really directly hardwired. And so we can tap into this beautiful palette of aromatics we get from the plant kingdom um, to help us in almost having um, an immediate sort of resolution um, of something that we're going through or something that we're experiencing. Um, I think that aroma can really carry us through some of those moments in a really super powerful, profound, easy, easily accessible sure. way. So, and it's not just essential oils. You yeah. could be pinching and smelling a plant in your garden yeah. or really just spending time with an herbal tea and smelling the herbal tea. And, um, but it is, it is an instant, so quick uh, and it's so fabulous how much it works. And of course, there's so many amazing plants out there that mm. smell amazing. So you have a huge palette to choose from. It's almost like magic. You could call it magic. You could call it science. Yeah. You could call it smagic. Smagic. <laughs> what did Rosemary say? Uh, what was that word? Butte. Butte. Is beautiful and functional. Yeah. Or butility. Butility. So now we got smagic. We got smagic. butility. We got smagic. smagic. Right. That's right. <laughs> whoop, whoop. Love it. All right. So that was 15 minutes ago. Thanks, by the way, for doing this interview right after oh, a class. Yeah. No, it's Love. a great time okay. to catch me. I was, I was, I ended off on, on the air element, but I really got into the fire element. Oh, I okay. was telling them all about fire, wow. how fire is so important. Yeah. Everyone should be all about fire. And of course I was just kidding because <laughs> that's just me. Are you a fiery type I mean, person? No, 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 not at all. No. <laughs> Nope, not me. <laughs> so that class was 15 minutes ago. I want to go a little bit in the past here. And you just came back from, I want to say, Scotland. And yeah. I just, maybe you could tell us about your trip. Any lessons learned there or any yeah. stories? Yeah. Or... Oh, gosh, so many. So yeah. so um, that's where I went to university for herbal medicine. It was in Scotland. And I had several years of clinical practice there before I immigrated back into the U.S. Yeah. Um, and I hadn't actually been back in in the UK since I left in 2008. So um, 15 years it had been or more. I think the math is right there. 
Um, and it was really beautiful because in many ways it was like a, it was a homecoming for me. It was also a way for me to um, sort of try out and test some of my work in the world, um, to see a bunch of people that um, used to be so important to me or still are very important to me, but also we just have lost touch, you know. And so I got to reconnect with a whole bunch of, um, of really great people and just do a lot of really fun stuff. I was on a, I'll get to the, I'll get to the herbal stuff in a second, sure. but I was actually on a site build mm. for uh, the Shambhala Music Festival, mm. which is really kind of crazy. Uh, I, I think I'm still riding on my Shambhala <laughs> vibes. I, don't, I think that's probably what's happening, but yeah. um, I was on a crew um, that helped build that festival. And so um, there was like 25,000 people there. It was kind of like, I'm just going to pretend like I'm in my twenties again. Wow. And I had, <laughs> that was how my trip ended. But the, yeah. the whole reason I went over there, I mean, other than all of that beautiful stuff was that, um, I got asked by an organization called Ruskin Mill, uh, to come over and do a Gertian plant study and aromatic distillation workshop and staff training. Yeah. And so, um, Gertian science and phenomenology is sort of like a philosophy of, of science and what my mentor Craig Holdridge talks about is, uh, living thinking models um, in, in the scientific realm. And so plant study is a big part of this where we are kind of learning to sort of observe and perceive the, the, the expression or the character of, of who a plant is in the world or in the landscape um, in, a, in a way that is sort of less about what it can do for us and more about who it is in its own right. And so it's a, it's a really beautiful practice of observing nature. I'll just say that. It's an easy way of putting it. It's very, that's a Cliff Notes version. Okay. So it was, um, it, the, the whole event itself was a three-day landscape study. I called it the essence of place. Um, and I was, I spent, it was a beautiful piece of land called Pishwantan Wood, uh, which used to be stewarded by one of my first teachers in Gertian science, Margaret Cohoon, uh, who has since passed away. Um, that land has now gone into um, the care holding of the Ruskin Mill Trust. And it's this beautiful piece of 80 acres of uh, land in the in the Scottish rural Scottish eastern Scotland up near the sea, uh, not too far from Edinburgh, um, and so we focused on these three sort of archetypal plants on the landscape. Uh, one was Scots pine, of course. Uh, <laughs> one was wild angelica, which is sort of an edge dweller, mm -hmm. and then also uh, meadowsweet, the Philippendula ulmaria, which is this amazing to see it growing the way that it does in its natural habitat was just. It was mind blowing to me because it's one of my favorite favorite herbs of all time, um, and it's it's a bog dweller. It likes the bottoms where it's wet, and it was like this is this place was it's a very wet place and very boggy and just vast amounts of meadow sweet everywhere. So we did um, sort of systematic plant studies with each of these species, um, and then we collected water from the land and we distilled those three plants in the copper alembic still. And I took them through the whole process of distilling aromatics and all of that to. Um, kind of come out of the other side with this this essence of place. Mm. But one of the most beautiful things about it um, that I, I thought was really just super lovely um, was that I had every day I had them go out of the workshop. I had them go out and find a spot in the landscape where they would just sit for 30 minutes and they would just sit and observe, you know, and try to clear their, their thoughts about what they were thinking or why they were thinking, but just to perceive where they were. And their task for the first day was to write a couple of sentences about what they observed. The task for the second day was to distill those, that paragraph into a single sentence about what they were observing. And by the third day, I asked them for a single word, just one word, about their sit spot. And so as we're putting all of the stuff together in the still and the plants, we're harvesting the plants together, we're bringing them into the still, uh, we have the water that we got from the creek, you know, and everyone's using the jar to put water in the pot. Really super beautiful. I had everyone go around and write down their word and then read it out loud and then put that folded piece of paper into the still. Mm. And so this all got distilled into this essence of place that came out on the other side, you know. Um, it is probably one of the most <laughs> magical, moving important things I've ever been able to hold space for, really. It was really, um, and to do that in Scotland, where, I mean, that's half my soul still lives over there. Yeah. It was really quite magical. Yeah, so I'm still sort of buzzing on all of that. It almost makes me feel as if the people that were writing down their one word, as if they were distilling down. Exactly. That is so cool. Yeah. yeah. I love that. I know. 
I thought it was pretty cool too. Did you make that up? No, uh, I mean, well, yes. I mean, I, I, mean, I, I, I well, awesome. did I make it up? I mean, <laughs> sure. I, I, these things have come to me through yeah. time through other teachers. Absolutely. You know, right. I, I, in that form, yeah. I would say that yes. That's I, neat though. Yeah. I love that yeah. so much. I, I've always wanted to ask you this. What is your fascination and connection to Scotland? And I'm asking kind of selfishly because I'm 23% Scottish. Are you? And so I've always uh, been fascinated and wanting to get more immersed in that culture. Mm. And uh, there's another herbalist named Cash Robertson. He re recently changed his name to Austin Robertson. And he said he just visited Scotland and yeah. he's just had a magical experience and just connecting with the land and the yeah. people there. So I want to go and I'm just wondering like, what what is it about Scotland that fascinates you? Well, it's definitely um, a part of my like I'm a bit of a mutt, but uh -huh. um, it is a very large part of my ancestral history. Sure. Um, and especially the side of my family that has always been in the practice of medicine. And so it's my, it's my mother's grandfather's name or my mother's father's name, my grandfather, matrilineal grandfather's name. And many Guthrie's before him mm. were medical doctors. Um, and I think that it was just serendipity or the universe kind of, um, and it, all of its blessings that kind of funneled me that direction to go to university. Yeah. Um, but, but being there, you know, uh, it's, it's kind of, it's just in my DNA, yeah. it's in my blood. Yeah. Um, and I can really, I really feel that way when I'm, I'm there. Um, and so I think I'm fascinated with Scotland because it represents a part of my, my heritage that I wouldn't otherwise have access to, sure. you know? Yeah. Like a lot of us mutts. Yeah. I'm a mutt too. Yeah. Just straight up. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so it sounds like you have medical doctors in your lineage. So yeah, it just so happens that you're kind of, you're an herbalist. I like, know. You're, you're I let them all down. Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> That's a joke. That's it. It's actually, I'm healing ancestral trauma. I love That's that. That's what I'm doing with my herbalism. Better put. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Just a quick break from the show to thank our presenting sponsor, Oshala Farm. Oshala Farm is a beautiful and vibrant certified organic herb farm based in Southern Oregon, where they grow and sell over 80 different plant species. The founders, Elise and Jeff Higley, have been longtime friends, so I highly trust their growing methods and ethics. You'll love the potency and vibrancy of all the herbs they have to offer. To learn more and purchase their herbs and other organic goods, head to oshalafarm.com. So thanks once again to Ashala Farm for sponsoring the Herbalist Hour. Now back to the show. Enjoy. Okay, so we went 15 minutes ago. We went, you know, last week or whenever you came back from Scotland. Let's go a little further back. Yeah. What was a young Erica like? <laughs> and how did you kind of evolve into getting to the herbal path, if you will? Okay, um, so let's see. I mean, I, we, how far back are we going? Let's go to seven and a half. Oh, uh, um, <laughs> seven and a half. I was, uh, I was a sprightly young thing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I still am. Yes. Um, let's see. Uh, mm. I, I had a, a passion for odd haircuts. Uh, I still do. Still do. <laughs> and, um, I Your hair is dope, by the way. I Thank love it. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. yeah I'm, I'm, I'm really channeling fire in my life yes. right now. Like, that's yeah. just where I'm at. So I'm like, consume me, please. Totally. Let me set it on fire. <laughs> Um, I haven't sworn once, by the way. Uh, fucking A, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> so when I was, yeah, so when I was seven, I was an avid yeah. soccer player. Yeah. Um, I played, I played soccer most of my young life. Um, mm. So I was really into sports and like activities that way. And I loved school and, you know, super brainy. And yeah. um, I loved playing and being outdoors. And, you know, um, I think I, I remember myself. It's like my inner little girl. Like mm. she's, she's about seven. Yeah. And, uh. Yeah, she was pretty rad, okay. I think. Yeah, and then life happened, you know, and it sure. all gets a little bit tougher Oof. from there. But we'll just skip that part. Sure. We'll go, <laughs> we'll go to, um, so I graduated from high school. I was in Philadelphia, mm. and I needed to, like, get the fuck out. Yeah. So um, my ticket was uh, really great grades and uh, lots of scholarships. So I decided to go to the University of Oregon yeah. in Eugene. Yeah, my hometown. Where I had what I called my barefoot revolution, yeah. which you can imagine if all places on the planet, you're going to have one, it's going to be there. Yeah. Um, and that's before, this is like late 90s. This yeah. is before Eugene got like super swamped down with all of the, you know, all of the developments. Yeah, true. Um, so it was a much milder place back then, more simple place back then. Um, and so, yeah, and, and, and that's, I mean, that was the first time I was introduced to herbs was, was there. There's community people that are rocking herbs and have been for, you know, decades. And 
um, taking a couple classes here and there and even took a class or two with Howie, although oh. he doesn't remember. <laughs> but, you know, why would he? He's, he's, he's taught a lot of people. He yeah. taught people, you know. So, um, and it was sort of, so I, I was doing a, an undergraduate degree with a focus in sort of linguistics and medical anthropology and Spanish. And I realized that as I was graduating from university, that if I was going to do anything with that, if I wanted to, I was going to have to stay in academia. And I was like, nope, that's a hard no. Yeah. Um, but in the process, I had fallen in love with, I fall in love with herbs. And I think like a lot of people, I really dove into it for my own healing work and my own healing journey. Yeah. Um, and I was finding solutions and tools that I didn't know existed to be able to manage my own health issues and so it kind of was this this unfolding that happened through my own my own work on myself and my relationship with my body and then there's herbs and this, so and from there it, I it was very it became very obvious like okay this is what I'm supposed to be doing yeah. like, I'm not supposed to be an anthropologist what the fuck was that about yeah. I mean I'm great I'm grateful because I learned so much especially the medical anthropology piece um, but uh, so so from there I decided that. Um, I wanted to I wanted to pursue uh, you know being an herbalist and being a clinician and at the time I didn't feel like there was um, there were programs available to me that were going to sort of fit the the mark of what I felt like I needed yeah. um, in order to feel like I was on the right path for that yeah. so um, I ended up figuring out that if I could get over to the UK and apply to university. I would only have to pay $3,500 a year for a four-year degree. And I was like, well, that's the route. It's a good deal. So um, I'm very privileged and very blessed to have been able to make that happen. Um, it took a lot of hustle to get there and to, to do that work. But so that was the Scottish School of Herbal Medicine. It was based out of Glasgow. Um, yeah, and you just talked about Cash Robertson. He was out hanging out with Keith Robertson. Oh, wow. He was one of my teachers. Oh, no way. One of the founders of no the relation, Scottish School. Though. No relation, though. No relation. Well, they're all, all the Robertsons. Sure. They are all part of the same, <laughs> the same clan. Yeah. They all wear the same tartan. Um, so, so yeah, so that's, that's sort of the, there's many wispies in that story that I could have embellished, but that's sort of the facts. <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah. So just FYI, I'm a, I'm Hutchison. Our oh, clan yeah. is Donald. Oh, you're a Donald. Yeah, I'm a Donald. Ah. So I found that out by going to you're the Scottish Fest in Eugene. as well? Did Donald you, Duck. Uh, you, Actually, I did have a friend tell me my spirit animal was a duck once. So, no kidding. Yeah. Well, did you go to the University of Oregon? No. Oh, I see what you're doing there. <laughs> see, no, I did not. Oh, no, okay. I am a Lane Community College That's alum. it. That's <laughs> it. And Columbine School of Botanical Studies. Yeah. And Arcto School of Botanical yeah. Studies. Yeah. Yes, Either okay. Way. Okay. Well, that's where I was going to I love that you got the Eugene connection and our friend Stephen Yeager is a Philly Eugene kid as well. I know. Yeah. And he used to go, I used to sing in this band called Nectar Way. When oh, wow. I was living really? in Eugene. Yeah, I was one of the <laughs> I was one of their backing vocalists. That's awesome. He used to come to our shows. <laughs> wow, no. I way. know. He's like, I remember Nectar Way. And I'm like, wow, you remember that one gig we yeah. did in the roller skating rink? I was just gonna like, ask, did you do roller derby in Eugene too? No, no, no okay. I didn't do roller derby in Eugene. Later. That was just that's just Athens, Ohio version okay. of Erica. Okay. What, do you have a roller derby name? Yeah, Daisy Love Dirt. <laughs> I know, it's good, right? It's so fucking good. <laughs> <laughs> and it's Daisy, D-A-Z-E-Y. Just ah, to be clear. Okay. And love dirt is all one word. Daisy's yeah. also a duck. Oh my god. <laughs> There's so much duck going on right now. That's hilarious. Can you hear your duck voice? Oh duck. <laughs> oh my goodness. You've been yeah, practicing. I have for twenty five years. <laughs> That's beautiful. Something like that. Okay. Yeah. Well, thanks for the history lesson. Yeah. It's nice to get to know you a little bit more. Yeah. Um, well, let's talk about some plants. That's what the people oh, came for. Yeah. Do you want to tell us a, a little bit about maybe yarrow since there, I see some growing on the There's a there. really beautiful yarrow right over there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So this plant is amazing. This, I, I, it's so interesting. So when I, when I left Scotland, it was a big, really huge decision to make because I, I had a full-time clinical practice. I had a life. I had, I had a place I was, I had, you know, living. I had uh, friends. I had, my whole life was there. Mm. Um, and I was sitting on a, I was sitting on the back garden one day. It was actually on my birthday, which is in July. Um, and it was it really the first time I felt like the sun on my skin and I was like actually kind of warm and it was unusual because winters in Scotland are really, they're pretty rough. It's dark. It's, you know, it's never really that warm. And I'm sitting there going like, oh, I just need to leave. 
Um, and I had this feeling like, okay, it's time to go. It's really, it's time to go back to the U.S. I've, I'm going to have to completely reinvent myself and reinvent my life. This is a big challenge, and I might get lost along the way. And one of the things that I wanted to do, as I often do, is I wanted to sort of like leave a mark on on the physical being of myself to remind me of my path and my journey and everything that I had been through and where I was supposed to be heading in life. And um, and so I did a lot of research and um, I was in the Glasgow library looking at um, this, um, I can't remember the name now because I'm tired, <laughs> but it's a document yeah. where they published um, a bunch of the old prayers that the monks used to use in the monasteries of Scotland when they were working with plants. So the monasteries were, the, were also the hospitals. Mm -hmm. And there, so there's this book that has all of these beautiful, um, it, it's all in Scots Gaelic, all these beautiful sort of prayers that were used in conjunction with the harvesting and making of medicines of these plants. And the one that I was called to was the yarrow. Mm. Um, and so I, I can't pronounce it in, in Scots Gaelic, um, but I have a tattoo. I did it in my own handwriting. I was like, okay, I'm gonna go get a tattoo. It's gonna be of this prayer. And the English translation is, I will pull the arrow, I will pull it with my strength, I will pull it with the hollow of my hand. And to me, this is about, this like this is, in, this is the intention that makes me want to do this. And in fact, I actually have a little pendant, a yarrow, yarrow pendant on. Oh, awesome. Yeah. yeah. And so it's like, for me, it's like this, this is my work in the world. You know, I will pull it with my strength, I'll pull it with the hollow of my hand. And so the, the arrow has always been a symbol for me of, of, of this path as, a, as an herbalist mm -hmm. and all of the things that that brings. So, so the yarrow is also, um, I have learned um, through a couple of my mentors from Aromanosis, Kathy Skipper and mm -hmm. Florian Berkmayer. Awesome, those are awesome folks right there. Um, they talk a lot about the symbol of yarrow being sort of the wounded healer's archetype yeah. in the, the wounded healer's medicine and the story of Achilles uh, and of course of Chiron, um, Chiron the wounded healer who you know, became a healer through processing his own wounds um, and learning to manage his own pain. He was able to then help facilitate uh, the pain in, in others. And so Yara has kind of become the symbol of the wounded healer. Mm. And I very much see myself on that journey. Yeah. Um, of, uh, you know, being, people talk about like, oh, what do you do? Oh, you're an herbalist. Oh, you're a healer. And I'm like, no, yeah. I don't use that word unless I'm talking about the work I'm doing on myself. Like that. Yeah, so you know, so I'm I'm the wounded healer. My clients are the healers. They're the you know, and the yarrow is a sort of archetype for this process of being committed to. For me, being committed to my own journey of healing, mm -hmm. and and herbalism is has become the is the conduit for that work this time around in this incarnation. And so it's it's become a very spiritual symbol for me. Um, it's one of protection, but it also that it's that reminder. You know, like your work is your healing path. Yeah. yeah. And you can only help facilitate that work in other people if you're prepared to do that work on yourself. Um, so that's, that's Yaro. One thing I love <laughs> about your work, Erica, thank you for sharing, yeah. is uh, you have such a beautiful way of merging science and spirituality and just mm -hmm. inner work and stuff like that. And I think you're the epitome of a great herbalist in that regard. Because like, you don't swing too far one way or the other, but I feel like you're adept in both realms. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I love I love that about mm -hmm. certain herbalists, and and you I think you mesh all the worlds so Thank well together. You. So absolutely, yeah. So that's actually a perfect segue <laughs> into a question I wanted to ask you. Uh, one of your recent episodes on the Herbal Sensorium. Yes. Podcast. Subscribe. On I'm, your podcast player I'm way choice. behind. I might get one out once a month. <laughs> FYI. You, you juggle a lot. You wear many hats and uh, <laughs> yeah. sovereignty herbs. So yeah. Uh, so you talk about dandelion as a talisman. And yeah. I just kind of curious, why is dandelion a talisman for you? Oh, yeah. yeah. And maybe maybe define for me what a and the audience is. what a talisman is. Yeah. So so a talisman is like a is an object of significance that takes on um, it takes on a, me a meaning for the carrier, and that could be a spiritual meaning. It could be a memory. It could be, um, it could be magical. It could be, it could be anything. Right. So you know, I, I carry the arrow around, uh, in uh, around my neck as sort of like a talisman, right? Which is this kind of physical reminder of a belief or a will or a prayer or you know something something that has become sacred that reminds you of a sacred process or a sacred place. Um, 
Yeah, in that episode of um, of the Herbal Sensorium, I talked about dandelion as a talisman. Sort of um, now that I'm now that we're talking about it, I don't even actually think I can remember. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I might get there if I talk sure. it through. It's like, oh shit, what was I talking about in that episode? It was so important at the time. It was mind blowing. Okay. <laughs> so, it was four months ago or oh, yeah, something like yeah, that. A lot has happened <laughs> yeah. in the last four months. But um, I was I was kind of going through the you know the root and the leaf and the flower sort of as these different sort of reflections of clinical practice um, and clinical work. And I don't exactly remember what the theme was of them going together, but it was really cool at the time. Okay, that's fair. Yeah. And it was- Sorry to bombard you with that. I know, it's totally okay. Now I'm gonna be like, oh my gosh, I should remember what I'm talking about publicly. But yeah, um, but yeah no, it was, it was a way for me to structure the podcast yeah. so I could talk about these three core elements of clinical practice in relationship to like this, the archetype of the dandelion. Yes. Yeah, you know, okay. this idea of, the archetype of the dandelion. So, yeah. so that's kind of what I meant by that. Respect. Yes. Okay. <laughs> that's all good. What was that about? I can't remember. Um, Only four I, months ago. I will say I could pull up the episode, um, not play it per se, but it was it was about three pillars of clinical herbal practice. Oh, I don't know. If, yes. Yeah. Safety, ethics, and accountability. Yeah. Okay. Now I'm on board. Mason of the all rescue. Right. The boat has sailed. I'm on it. Here we go. Yeah. <laughs> nice work, buddy. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, so so in in my in my clinical work and in the clinical mentorship that I do, I'm very much about uh, remembering our, our values and um, staying true to our values in our clinical work. And for me, I think that these values are can be as diverse as there are herbalists out there. But I think that for the way that I I practice as an herbalist and the way that I mentor my students to practice is having safety ethics and accountability at the center of everything that you do. Um, and I feel that the, the reason why I, I say this is because for me, this is about elevating the reputation of the profession. This is about elevating clinical herbalism um, as an important, uh, the herbalist as an important role in a person's life. It's about defining that space, holding that space for ourselves um, rather than in juxtaposition to other sort of medical phenomenon that are out there. Um, and so, so safety, ethics, and accountability are these three major pillars of clinical practice. I actually think there's 12, okay. honestly, if I'm, if I'm really honest about them. But wow. these three are really at the center. And so I used the, the route to kind of talk about, you know, safety. Mm -hmm. right? This is like, this is that first, the first herb that a lot of people get into is dandelion, yeah. right? And it's yeah. the root, it's dandelion root. I mean, I can remember it was one of the first herbs I ever tried and I'm like decocting it and drinking, you know, quart jars of it for some reason. Best shits of my life, but like, <laughs> not like, not something that you do every day. Yeah. You know, it's not every day you're messing around with quarts of dandelion root, but I, I mean, that's how I started in my herbal journey, yeah. you know, but it's, it's one of those herbs that you can do that with. And the root in particular, it's like this, this is the, this practice of tonic safety, like mm -hmm. sa safety tonic. Um, so ethics was for me, it was, a, is, it was about the leaf. Um, it was about, um, I brought in the idea of, of structure and having really good structures in your clinical practice, being reliable, you know, all these different things that we need to consider as, as clinicians. And as far as our ethics are, you know, do no harm, you know, all these other things, uh, food is medicine, you know, these kinds of things. And then, um, and then accountability was the flower. And what accountability means is that like, for me um, in my clinical work, it's very important that I can hold myself accountable for my actions and that my clients can hold me accountable for my actions. Um, I can learn to hold myself accountable through reflective practice, right? Which is um, something that our friend Mel Casting teaches about really, really well. Um, she just did a class for Sovereignty Herbs and the Herbal Practice Connection on that. Uh, so we can learn to hold ourselves accountable by dedicating time in our clinical lives to reflective practice and doing reflective exercises. But I also feel that for me, being held accountable to something larger than myself is an important um, aspect of the journey of trust between my client and I. And I, I want my client to know that there's someone that they can go to, to complain about me or to say that I've crossed an ethical line or um, to file a complaint or a grievance. And so um, this is why I have maintained my, um, my memberships with the National Institute of Medical Herbalists in the UK and why I'm a professional member of the American Herbalist Guild as an RH. Mm. 
Um, and I, I, my membership to those organizations is, you know, it's about the herbalism community. It's about maintaining the, and elevating the profession and all of that. But it, for me, is also a way of being held accountable to a code of ethics and something where, you know, I can say to my clients, if you think I've done something wrong, go to these people and make a complaint. Mm -hmm. And because, and I think that that, that provides a, a certain level of, of innate trust, inherent trust in the relationship as well. Um, yeah. So holding myself accountable, but also being able to be held accountable by others. So, so the dandelion was sort of like this, <laughs> this map yeah. through my, my, of my brain on these three topics. And I think it, it, wor it worked out really wonderfully. I love that. Uh, yeah. Thank you for reminding me. Of course. It was a really good episode. <laughs> <laughs> Herbal sensorium subscribe. Yeah. Thanks. So you said, um, reflective practice mm -hmm. that was a class that mel casting taught for yeah. the er, uh, herbal practice connection yeah i guess a couple questions can you kind of um concisely like tell us what a reflective practice is um and is that class that full-on class available to members of the herbal practice connection currently yeah or did you have to attend that live yeah no um it is it has been recorded um and it is in the um resource the, the growing resource library that, that is the herbal practice connection um so yeah so reflective practice is i think in a nutshell what i'll say is yeah. the concerted effort to take time to reflect on your thoughts and beliefs and your actions and your clinical work why did I do what I did? Why do I think the way that I think? You know, and and the, the why can be big. The why can be can be deeply culturally ingrained. Yeah. You know, it can be inherent bias. It can be all different kinds of things. It can also be looking at okay, what went really super well here, and what did not go well here. It can be about looking at um, complicated client practitioner relationships. Like I've I've had a few. Um, in recent years where um, I've been really grateful for reflective exercises and journaling because I've had difficult interpersonal, you know, things that have come up in the clinic room, which if I didn't navigate correctly could cause harm. Yeah. And so I always say that for me, like reflective practice is about learning how to own your own shit so yeah. you don't make other people smell bad. <laughs> right? like so you that. don't smear that all over everybody sure. else. Because, you know, in, in our clinical position, we have the capacity to cause a lot of harm. Especially if we, if we can't own our own shit, yeah. you know, if we can't own our own psychology, what drives us, what makes us make our decisions, what dogma we have, we can easily start projecting all of this onto our clients. And in that way, they can never do their own healing work. Yeah. And we can also start to cause pretty significant harm. And so I think reflective practice is sort of a, a psychological sort of backing up, looking at the bigger picture of something that is going down or that went down and really being able to evaluate where your choices and decisions and actions came from in yourself. And I think this is a really super important and healthy part of being a clinical practitioner. Yeah. And this is why I love Mel's class because yeah. she really, she dives really deep into this um, own your own shit stuff. And it's really super important. It's, I don't think it's taught enough, honestly. I have a few comments. First <laughs> of all, herbal practice connection. You could find more about that at herbalpracticeconnection.com. That's, That's connection right. Connection with an X. That's connection with an we'll, X. Uh, we'll leave a link uh, in the show notes, um, in the in the YouTube description and whatnot. But uh, I guess another comment I have is, why I love Mel. That's so cool that she's teaching this. How did how did you come about? Like how did this become her specialty, and why did you reach out to her for specifically to teach this class? Well, I feel like that would be her story to tell. Sure, okay. I think that yeah. would be her story to tell. I you know she's so very neat, yeah. She's yeah. so passionate about. I mean, I see her as a dear friend, but I yeah. also see her as a colleague in the yeah. sense that um, her her clinical mentorship, like mentoring students, is yeah. a huge passion of yeah. hers, and I think that as part of being a responsible mentor and a, also a responsible clinician, like mm -hmm. we have to teach this, like let's own your shit yeah. here. Like how much of this is you and how much That's of this so is your client, important. you know? And so yeah. I think, you know, for me, it seems like a natural part of her work because based on her passion of clinical mentorship and things like that. Um, and so, you know, because her and I are pals yeah. and there's, there's not a lot of us who are, are doing clinical mentorship in the way that we are. There's like, there's Mel, there's me, there's Camille Freeman, yeah. um, are really trying to sort of hold space for yeah. this really precious time where you've got a student that's graduated from a program yeah. who is looking to step into clinical practice and needs to have that modeled in some capacity. And so 
Um, you know, Mel really works with students while they're still in school. I work with them right when they leave school. And then Camille is like a couple of years into practice, right. you go to her. <laughs> it's nice like, synopsis. Yeah, and, it's like a trifecta. <laughs> and I didn't want to make it seem like, why Mel? I, I was more like intrigued as oh, in like yeah. super proud of her that she's doing that work. And oh, I've never yeah. really heard of, of that specific class. So I thought that was really neat that you yeah. chose her. So since we're, uh, so, <laughs> so since we're done. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so since we're talking about it, yeah. uh, why don't you tell us more about the Herbal Practice Connection? Yeah, uh, yeah. I really love this. I love it. I love it so much just because it's cool. Um, <laughs> it's a really cool thing, and it's like it's it just needed to be born into the world. Yeah. I really love it. So, so the Herbal Practice Connection is um, a, a network off of social media, away from all of those spaces. Um, it's its own sort of housed network. Um, and it is for my, my like elevator speech is a space for seedling through seasoned practitioners of clinical herbalism, seeking guidance and support to build and grow their clinical practice. Um, and so it's a platform for my clinical mentorship, but also my business mentorship. And it's membership based, which is really great because people can sometimes they can budget better that way. Um, and so you get into the network, the Herbal Practice Connection with an X, because I think that's cool. <laughs> and you can actually spell connection that way. It's an old actual way of spelling. Did not know that. Yeah, All I mean, right. I was like, oh, this is the word. <laughs> um, so HPX for short. Yeah. Um, so once, you, once you're in the network, you have access to three different spaces. Um, the, the different spaces are sort of content oriented. So you have the consultation room. Um, and that's uh, all sorts of content that's related to the actual practice of clinical herbalism, working one-on-one -on -one with clients. It's where I do my case reviews and uh, we talk about all kinds of clinical conundrums there. Um, we also have the office and marketing garden, um, which is really where we're looking at more at sort of, you know, business infrastructure, clinical systems, um, marketing, you know, advertising, some of these like the pieces and parts about running a business and having a business function. Um, so that's that space. And then the third space is the apothecary, which is where we talk about the plants themselves, but we also talk about managing your own dispensary and what that's like or not managing or how you get herbs to clients or things like that. So there's these three major kind of like main rooms and each of them have an events calendar. But generally speaking for the Herbal Practice Connection members, um, once a week you're getting like a group event. Um, I do a pep talk once a month, which is basically we just get around and have a round table about like a certain subject in clinical practice, um, usually themed for the month. Um, I'll do a workshop, which is sort of like a more of a training or a class. Um, I also have these specialty trainings, which is really, really fun. So I've got teachers that come in from outside of Herbal Practice Connection to teach a class. Mm. Um, so last month it was Mel Casting and Reflective Practice. This month in September is Lindsay Feldposh. She's going to do herbal formulation. That's awesome. Um, Steven Yeager is going to come in in November to do CGMPs for dispensing herbalists. Um, and so... Good choice. Yeah. I've, yeah. Got, I've got some pals. I think yeah. Seven Song's willing to come and do a class on the free really? clinic model. Seven Song? Yeah. Okay. No, I know. He sucks. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so every month I offer, you know, I offer especially training from another teacher. Um, and then I also do case reviews. So every, every month has That's a theme. Huge. Um, and this right now, the theme for, for this month in September is all about transparency. Um, it's one of the pillars of clinical practice. Um, and so I'll bring a case that, um, I, I bring a case to the table that sort of encompasses that, that theme and, and how that theme showed up in my clinical practice and how like I learned about being a better clinical practitioner because of this was an issue of transparency. Yeah. Um, and so I'm going to do a case review about that this month as well. And so it's just really super awesome. You basically get, and you don't, you can, you show up, there's, there's forums, you can interact with other members, you can message each other. Um, there's lots of space for it to kind of grow and develop, but it's a really sweet space. Um, and it's just starting out, but I think it's really cool. <laughs> I think it's really well, cool. Well, you always do everything so beautifully, and oh, I'm sure thanks. it's a nice user experience inside of there. And yeah, uh, yeah definitely check it out, uh, uh, herbalpracticeconnection.com. With an X. With an X. Yeah. Don't forget the X. Yeah. Just one X. All right. Cool. Well, uh, thanks for sharing. Uh, I want to transition a little bit, and uh, we're going to do something called Explain That Gram. And I stole this directly from a show called Hot Ones. 
on YouTube. Explain that. Yeah, grandma. basically, I'm like going to show grandma you. Grandma, what? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Explain that. <laughs> grandma weed. And uh, this is a picture from your Instagram, one of your Instagram accounts. Oh, at okay. sovereigntyherbs.com. At sovereigntyherbs.com. And uh, you could just kind of tell the greater story behind it because when I show you the picture, oh, you actually, in, in the. Um, in the picture, you say there is a story behind it. So we, we're just curious. I hope I remember. Not like the podcast. <laughs> yeah. right. Oh, I this love this image. This image shares a really cool story. And it's a beautiful picture. Yeah. It's probably on the screen right now. Oh, yeah. yeah. So so this photograph is a tintype photograph that was taken by a graduate student named Ashley Curie. Uh, in Athens, Ohio. She's a brilliant photographer um, and her passion is tintype. And especially mm. when she's doing the processing in the field, there, she does, she goes into this dark tent and there's like alchemy going on. And then she comes out with this image and it's all very profound. Um, and she's super talented and she's doing this project right now on, um, she's really focused on, on witches and sort of the archetype of the witch. Um, and, and being in Appalachia, there's a lot of witchery that kind of come, just comes out of, it oozes out of us and sure. out of the landscape. And so um, she had asked me if uh, she could take my photograph um, as part of this exhibition that she's doing as part of her project. And I said, well, sure, this sounds really super fun. Um, and so what we came up with was me sitting with my still and what's really beautiful, this is right on the edge of my of my property, um, and where we are surrounded on all three sides by the Wayne National Forest. So there's a 3,000 acre parcel of national forest behind me there. And that particular spot is also where I buried my dog, Mello. Mm. Um, she passed away about three years ago. And she was like my, oh, my cry talking about it. Mm. She was like my, my psycho pump. That dog got me through um, some phenomenal times in my life and like losing her. <laughs> <laughs> losing her was um a catalyst of like a lot of hard stuff that i've had to i'm still like still trying to process i am i have become this copper olympic still yeah. and i am constantly in this process of transforming myself but her her passing was sort of the the catalyst for for several years of just hard stuff yeah. um and so sitting there and being captured in that photo that way it, it's like I could see my soul. I could see my soul in it, and it was it was my or even my elder self looking back at me, going like, "You got this." Yeah. 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 You're solid as nails, girl. Yeah. You, you keep your magic. Keep your magic going in the world. Um, I really feel like I'm in my power there. You know, sort of. Uh, not in like a sort of like power way, but like sure. more in like a You'd you know in that power. yarrow yeah. yarrow to my chest kind of way. You yeah. know. So um, it's a very powerful image for me, just, uh, just a reminder of how far I've come and um, how strong I am and how important my work in the world is. Um, yeah, so that's the story. That. It's a beautiful image. It's a beautiful story. Yeah. And I have to say, I was like scrolling through your Instagram, what am I gonna use? And Amanda immediately thought, oh, I know just the one, oh, and she recalled it, so. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we knew there was yeah. probably a great story behind that. I think it's so. kind of cool too, because I sort of look yeah. like this like shaggy ass Appalachian moonshiner. Which I know, is, you it know, looks old it's school. like my alter ego, you know. And that dress is super cool too. Yeah, yeah, yeah the dress was a good. That was a good call. That's you know, awesome. So, but yeah, yeah, it was sort of my moonshining. It looked like it looked like I'm moonshining there a little bit, which is fine. I do do that sometimes. <laughs> you got to still. You might as well, you know. Don't tell anybody. Right, right, right. <laughs> oh wait, this is our camera. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's just between you and me. Oh yeah, and yeah. Amanda. Wink, wink. <laughs> yeah. So, just a few more questions. Great. If you got the time. Oh yeah. I know we're getting hungry over here. I might have to pee, but um, okay. Sorry, we, we to cut that out. <laughs> no, okay. you should leave that in. <laughs> um, I I just uh, I'm just kind of curious. What is Erica and Sovereignty Herbs' mission? Like, why do you do this work? That's a really good question. Yeah. I ask I myself of that yeah. every day. <laughs> like, what is the mission here? Um, it's so interesting. So, I mean, Sovereignty Herbs has evolved over time. Um, and I never I never really knew where it was going to go. But it has started to really super, super take on its own character in the world. And I really see my work right now very clearly as my, as my clinical, Sovereignty Herbs is my clinical practice. So my work one-on-one -on -one with clients, um, which is very, very important work to me. And I'm, I'm very, I've been very clear now about, as an herbalist, the role that I play in people's lives. And so 
that's my platform to stay rooted in my education um, and my teaching, which is also a, a part of Sovereignty Herbs. And I, I do think that the, the mentorship from, you know, taking that leap from graduated student to practitioner, you know, this is where we lose so many talented herbalists because it is such a funky, it's like, the, and, and, and it's like, there's no path that is going to be the same. And you, you really have to be out there with a machete, fighting your way through, trying to figure out how do you turn this into a business? How can you practice and help people? And you have all the fears and you have society and you have everything that's going like, this is crazy. What are you doing? You know, and, and it can be isolating and lonely. And I just feel like there's so many people who've studied herbalism that just give up on that, on that heart path because they can't see how to get to that other side of the ravine. Yeah. So... I feel like Sovereignty Herbs and, you know, with the Herbal Practice Connection and my clinical mentorship, like that's the mission. The mission is like, we need more clinical herbalists working one-on-one -on -one with clients, hands down. Let's get you all across the ravine. Yeah. You know, this is, this is how I made the leap. This is how I got across the ravine. It may not work for you, but like, at least you'll have a blueprint and figure it out for yourself, you know? And so it just, it's making that, I don't know if I can do this to like, oh, hell yeah, I can do this. Um, and that, that I think right there is, that's the guts of Sovereignty Herbs. So it seems like HPX is almost like what your journey has been leading to yeah. in a lot of ways. And I love that you're a legit practicing herbalist teaching how to do it. Yeah. You're not just some huckster on the internet, like trying to make a buck. Yeah. You're like, you're or like, like an AI. I'm not AI right, going right. like, well, first you do this right. and then you do that, you know. And you, you <laughs> give feedback and you have the community and all this other stuff. So yeah, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. I'm really excited about it. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah, I love it. And, um, for those like just budding herbalists, uh, the aspiring herbalists to look to make, uh, herbalism, like their career or their life path, do you have just like any general basic advice for those people? Go and see an herbalist yourself. Ooh. Yeah. I don't think I've heard that one. Yeah. yeah. I think one of the best, I like that. one of the best things to do if you are a budding herbalist and you, even if you think you might want to work with people, um, to actually go and work with an herbalist yourself so you can experience at least that part of things. Now, every herbalist is going to be different. Every experience is going to be different, but actually being in the seat of the person receiving that care yeah. um, and also receiving that philosophy of, of health and wellness and working with the herbs, making the changes, doing the nutrition work, doing the, I got to make tea how many freaking times a day, <laughs> like putting yourself in that seat, yeah. I think, can provide you with a really super strong platform. It can also let you know like, hey, actually, you know what? Yeah, I would love to work with the public this way. Or like, oh, you know what? I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna stay, keep with family and friends and yeah. keep it small and make beautiful products. And, um, but I think working with an herbalist is gonna help side, like define where you wanna go, mm -hmm. but also give you some of that, that lived experience of what it's like to be on the other end of care, receiving care. So. That borderline should almost seem like obvious advice, but again, I don't think I've heard that yet, yeah. and I've asked the question a lot of times. So, yeah. oh, I love coming brilliant. up with new stuff. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Well, why don't we wrap it up with um, what's next for you? What are you excited about? What's coming? Yeah. Well, yeah. this year's been amazing with like yeah. just traveling and traveling and traveling and traveling yeah. and traveling and traveling. So I'm really glad that uh, after the Great Lakes Herb Fair here, yeah. I'm going to be back in Southeast Ohio for a while until I'm on the move again. But um, We've got the Ohio Paw Paw Festival coming up next oh, yeah. next weekend. So I'm teaching a class there. Awesome. Um, and then that first weekend in October, I'll be at United Plant Savers for their forest farming conference. Nice. I'm going to be leading up a, a plant walk and doing a panel discussion about bringing herbs to market. Um, I'm really excited about that. And then starting in October, it's like a deep dive into my six month a mentorship program. I've got five really lovely students. Awesome. Um, so we start our mentorship journey in October. Um, Is that separate from HPX then? Well, actually it's a part of HPX okay, now. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. So as part of the clinical mentorship, um, you also get 12 months membership to HPX oh. kind of wrapped into the package, but this is, they get to sit in on my clinic. Um, I sit in on their clients. It's um, really sort of a, it's a very intense um, kind of one-to-one -one mentorship and there's some group work that we do as well, but, um, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Uh, well, we, <laughs> the mosquitoes, um, <laughs> uh, 
we keep saying herbal practice connection, but you could also learn about Eric at sovereigntyherbs.com. Yep. Sovereigntyherbs.com. All the links will be below or the description <laughs> wherever we're at. So, um, <laughs> well, sweet. Uh, thanks for joining me. I just, I've been asking this lately. Do you have any closing thoughts? What you got for us? <laughs> Closing thoughts. I, I would just want to say thank you to you, Mason, yeah. and to you as well, Amanda, for the amazing work that you are doing, uh, keeping us all together. You really are community builders in a pretty epic way. And thank you so much. I just don't know what this, I don't know what this community, I don't know what herbalism would be like without Herb Rally. Oh, and I, wow. know, I know that it's not been an easy road, yeah. you know, and I'm oh. sure it's it's like a, a, a wily teenager who's yeah. kind of like you're trying you know, trying to kind of figure out who you're going to be in the world and how is it going to all work. And well, Herb Rally's an eight-year-old so far. Oh, so eight-year-old, yeah, yeah it's yes, a great getting age. There. It's great age. <laughs> <laughs> thank I you for the those. kind words. Yeah, We're so thank our, you. Our I think those are my closing thoughts. I love that. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah, and I'll definitely take a beer later. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Count on it. All right, well, thanks for joining me, and uh, thanks you all for listening. We'll uh, see you in the next episode of The Herbalist Hour. Bye. Bye. Thanks so much for watching today's episode of The Herbalist Hour. If you enjoyed it, please give it a thumbs up. And if you want more great herbal content, be sure to subscribe to our Herb Rally YouTube channel. Uh, if you enjoy these Herbalist Hour episodes and you'd like to join us live, uh, you can do so by becoming an Herb Rally Schoolhouse member. Uh, learn more at herbrally.com slash schoolhouse. And if you want to get your first 30 days for free, use coupon code YouTube30 at checkout. So our Herb Rally Schoolhouse members get access to exclusive video classes, monographs, and a lot more more herbal community discounts um, along with joining these live herbalist hour interviews so one more time herbrally.com slash schoolhouse enter coupon code youtube30 at checkout to get your first 30 days for free all right we'll see you in the next episode and take care